That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Woman in the Window, the ninth film. <laughs> or is it the eighth film? Uh, directed, eighth, directed by Joe Wright, <laughs> uh, which after many delays uh, is finally being released courtesy of Netflix, uh, was previously a 20th Century Fox property, uh, which will be available to stream May 14th, 2021. Do I know this director's other movies? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he did Pride and Prejudice uh, with Keira Knightley. Uh, I think that was his uh, debut. Uh, Anna Karenina, he did an adaptation of that. Atonement was a huge hit for him in 2007. Um, we, I remember we saw The Soloist together with Jamie Foxx and Robert mm-hmm. Downey Jr. Hannah, uh, which might be my favorite film by him. Um, I believe you saw Pan with Hugh Jackman and Darkest Hour with uh, Gary Oldman, who uh, won an Oscar for that role as Churchill. Okay, this is a murder mystery type film, right? It's based on the 2018 novel by A.J. Finn. Okay, the basic story revolves around a woman named Anna Fox, who's played by Amy Adams. So what do we know about Anna? So this is set in modern time uh, New York. Mm -hmm. Anna is a child psychologist, but she's not working because she suffers from agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. So she lives in this huge brownstone by herself. We understand that she's separated from her husband and her child, although we hear her communicating with them on the phone often, or with the husband, who's played by um, Anthony Mackie. Anthony Mackie. Okay. So Anna is stuck in her house. She has a couple of visits with her psychologist. Who's played by Tracy Letts, who adapted the screenplay. Oh, interesting. On the first visit with him, he's looking out the window and asking her about her neighbor, like the people who are just moving in, because she knows, he knows she's nosy and has done all her research. So we find out a little bit about the neighbors. We also find out Anna has a tenant named David who lives in her basement. Played by Wyatt Russell. That's right. Okay, so one day, the, the new neighbors, their like 15-year-old son, Ethan, comes over with a candle saying, my mom wanted me to bring this to you. Here you go. Played by Fred Etchinger. And she lets him in. Mm-hmm. And she shares she's a child psychologist. And he they seem to bond very quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then uh, the di- next day or days later, it's Halloween. And Anna shares with her tenant that she's going to turn off the lights and pretend she's not home so she doesn't have to pass out candy. So the neighborhood kids haze her house by throwing eggs at it. And for some reason, Anna thinks it would be a good idea to yell at them to stop. It's my house. Yeah, and she opens her front. She has like two, like like a dual stage entry system. Mm -hmm. So she goes to like the very front door that would open to the outside and then passes out. Mm -hmm. And someone assists her and brings her into her house. So when Anna comes to, she sees a woman played by Julianne Moore. Mm -hmm. And Anna says, oh, you must be Ethan's mother. You must be Jane Russell. Oh, you must be Jane Russell, who she thinks is Ethan's mother. They bond very quickly. (laughs) They have a, a lovely night. Okay, so then sometime later, Anna witnesses, because she keeps staring at the neighbors, she sees that there's some violence and the father of the house comes over played by Gary Oldman Mm -hmm. and he says have you met any of my family have you seen any member of my family this evening this evening I think that's before the violence happened is it before the violence Mm -hmm. but then what would compel her to lie about it because she she's eventually questioned about that and she says that she thought she was in trouble or she needed to lie about it or something. Well, anyway, when Gary Oldman comes over and says, have you met my family? She She says, no. Okay. This is also said over the course of a week. Oh, it's just a week. week. Okay. But then Anna witnesses Julianne Moore's character being stabbed. Mm -hmm. So, of course, freaks out, calls the police. They come over and they investigate. One of the cops is played by... Uh, Brian Tyree Henry. Yes. Detective Little. Detective Little, and then his counterpart is a lady. She's less patient with Anna. Mm-hmm. She just thinks Anna's crazy, and she says, haven't you made, like, false 911 calls before? Like, she, we just witnessed her make one prior, mm-hmm. um, or previously. So she, the female cop is very dismissive of Anna, but Detective Little seems a little more compassionate and is trying to explain to her that 
Jane Russell, the wife of Gary Oldman's character, is alive. Like, she's here. Like, we verified she's not dead. So maybe because of your emotional state and the medication you're on, because we find out she's on some drug called Elevan, mm -hmm. and it's like a newer drug in her routine. So Detective and, Little's like, maybe you're just experiencing some crazy side effects. Like, of which hallucinations are possible. Common. Mm -hmm. Okay, so things culminate with Anna... So she's kind of let that die, but then we witness a stretch of her, like, thought process and, like, her talking to her husband and her interacting with her tenant who she finds out is on parole. Okay. So things culminate with her receiving an anonymous email at, like, 2 in the morning that has a photo attached of, her, of Anna, her, like, asleep, passed out on the ground. So, of course, someone was in her house and took this photo. She calls the police freaking out, and she causes a scene. Because she starts accusing her tenant, saying that he's on parole. I don't know where he was. He has Jane Russell's earring by his nightstand. So that creates a mess. But it go ahead. But it kind of blows over, and then Dennis, uh, deci David decides to move. That's also the scene where we learn pretty significant information about her. Oh right. It's also that scene where we find out that she is not separated from her husband and her child. Her husband and child are dead. Mm -hmm. We find out that they were driving one night and her husband, Anthony Mackie's character, finds out <clears throat> Anna was cheating on him. So they kind of get into an argument and she drops her phone and like she's trying to reach for her phone while driving and okay. runs off the road. And a wintry road, yeah. And her child and daughter died. So... What we see of her now is her just sort of like living in a bubble. So that's probably what prompted, I mean, that's what prompted her agoraphobia and this alternate reality she lives in. So of course, as the audience were thinking, so she clearly made all of this up. But at the end, after everything's kind of like blown over because now D David is moving out and the neighbors have already clocked her, like leave us alone, Ethan shows up. The 15-year-old boy so, from across the street. Major spoiler here. Basically, Ethan says he's a serial killer in training. So, Julianne Moore is his mother. His biological. His biological mother. But she's separated from Gary Oldman's character. So, he does live with Jane Russell, but that's not his biological Who's mother. Who's played by Jennifer Jason Lee. Yes. Mm -hmm. He also shares that he killed someone back at where they were before in Boston. There's also a whole deal about Gary Oldman working in multiple places, which we'll get to. Um, so, and then he kills David, the tenant, because he's in the house trying to like protect Anna, kind of, or defend himself. But Anna gets the upper hand and ends up like killing him by knocking him through like a skylight. Mm -hmm. So the final scene of the film is Anna in the hospital, mm -hmm. and Detective Little shows up and apologizes to her for how bad of a job they did which we'll get to. I failed to mention that at one point, Anna... Oh, it's after, like, the... She accuses David of, like, maybe doing something to Julianne Moore, and the cops tell her, like, leave these people alone. She records, like, a suicide video, mm -hmm. but obviously doesn't proceed with it. So the detective says, hey, before I go, I have to take your cell phone as evidence, but I saw that video. So I'm going to leave you with this phone for a few minutes and then come back and get it. So you might want to delete that. And then the final shot is her in her home that she's clearly sold. So we can assume that she's going to move on. Mm -hmm. The end. And let her new life begin. Let your new life begin. Okay, <clears throat> that was a lot. <laughs> you can start. Um, so clearly, and I, I think the film sets up uh, a lot of uh, references, old film references, because she's drunk and popped up on pills and watching movies late at night a lot too. Uh, which I really appreciate because I... Uh, recognize you do the them. same. <laughs> That's what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> I'm not accusing you of that. I'm not any, on any prescription medication for the record. Uh, just over-the-counter box wine. Uh, so Over-the-counter <laughs> wine. <laughs> um, anyway, so clearly... Starting with the title, The Woman in the Window is actually a Fritz Lang film from 1944 with Joan Bennett and Edward G. Robinson, which I haven't watched that film in years, but I believe the mechanism in that is whatever's happening ends up being a dream. But clearly this is Hitchcockian to the max. Um, 
starting with, you get a clip of Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window, uh, the classic where he's got a broken leg, he's incapacitated, much like Amy Adams' character, and is, uh, you know, witnesses a murder uh, across the way. Uh, and also with Hitchcock, there's always a certain amount of doubling. Uh, and this film actually has meta-doubling, because it's doubling vertigo with the death of the uh, antagonist um, and the agoraphobia and with uh, the voyeurism of uh, Rear Window. Um, and also within the film, um, it, again, again, Jane Russell, of course, the actual actress, as the name that's oft repeated is kind of fetishistic, I think, in this. Uh, but of course, you have the doubling of Julianne Moore and Jennifer Jason Lee as these washed out blondes, uh, women of a certain age. Um, there's a bunch of other film references. Uh, Otto Preminger's Laura, which if you haven't seen it, uh, the undercurrent of necrophilia in that is uh, sublime, I think. Uh, Spellbound, another Hitchcock film in there. Um, but also, I, I, something not referenced that I brought to mind is Barbara Stanwyck in Sorry Wrong Number, where she's the, the invalid uh, that overhears a murder on the phone and is trying to reach the police from her uh, grand estate that's not unlike Amy Adams here as well. Um, and then of course getting to agoraphobia, copycat. I, I think there's a lot of uh, sequences in this that are very, from that kind of copycat, copycat. Specifically the ending where Amy Adams has to go up the stairs and do battle with the killer on uh, a rooftop. Uh, the battery might die so this video might end and I'm just gonna leave it like that just so people know. But anyway, continue. <laughs> No, thanks for interrupting my flow, but why don't, what's your next I'll one? just quickly go through my notes. I thought this movie would make a good, like, PSA for, like, drug side effects. Sure. Because for most of it, we're assuming that she's just hallucinating from this new drug she's on. Like the Soderbergh film side effects? Oh, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I thought Julianne Moore looks good as a blonde. And I really like her. I do too. And she did a really good job of playing like a nosy neighbor, like real housewife. Like all she wants to do is drink and talk shit. So um, I, I, I really like that. That scene made it, because she only really has one scene and she's pretty neurotic in it. <clears throat> and, uh, well, her and Amy Adams. And I was very uncomfortable to... Uh, um, you know, as a personal friend of Kurt Russell, it pains me to say this, but um, I thought his son's acting was crunchy, well, especially when he's explaining why he was on parole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was pretty bad. Um, yeah, Wyatt is, uh, doesn't have the same kind of screen presence. Of course, you know, he's the new Captain America. Oh, um, okay. Um, I like Tracy Letts. I think he's a fantastic author. Um, you know, this film, I, I don't know that we brought this up yet, but it was supposed to be released by Fox and theaters October of 2019, but due to test audience reactions, was recut. Uh, the re-release date, of course, was moved because of COVID-19, so here we are. But I have to believe that this was probably a lot more elegant as written by Letts. You know, he wrote Bug and Killer Joe for uh, Freakin and has been in a ton of films. Uh, I have to imagine that some uh, dumb, dumb test audiences' responses uh, required reshoots and uh, uh, an ending that is leading us by the hand, which I think is, it's really the third act that I think kind of ruins an otherwise elegant film. I agree. Um, there are some interesting graphics that I thought were, they do feel like stuff you'd see in an old Hitchcock film, which I, I think were a little heavy handed because I think the messaging of Anna's, like this character Anna being mentally unsound it's just too much. Like, it, it doesn't allow for me as the audience to feel like there is a reality where she's not making all of this up. Mm -hmm. That being said, though, I did want to mention uh, the final scene where Ethan is attempting to kill her. He hits her in the face with a garden tool, the oh. thing that has, like, three teeth. Mm -hmm. I thought that looked really cool. Isn't that a... Not a hoe. Uh, I wanted to call it a hoe, but I don't think that's what it is. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to mention the cop. I thought his final scene with her, where he tells her, like, I want to apologize, like, we made so many mistakes. I don't think they made any mistakes. I don't, I agree with that, yeah. So I, I really didn't like how that character was handled. I think they needed to establish some kind of other emotional connection with them. It's, mm -hmm. it's clear he's compassionate, but they, they needed a little more. And it could have been easy because that cop shares with Anna that he has four children. Mm -hmm. And she's a child psychologist. Mm -hmm. So maybe it would have made sense if like she had counseled one of his kids. Mm -hmm. So he's more compassionate towards her. But as it is, it's just like, no, he did good police work. Like she made accusations. They followed up. They have evidence that it's not true. Why would, why would he apologize for everything they did? And who would have thought that this random rich kid is a serial killer. <laughs> like, 
very bad seed. Uh, but I, I I feel like that should have that could have been left so much more ambiguous and could have been very fulfilling. Um, it was oh. shot by Bruno Delbonel, who uh, was the Jean-Pierre Genet, Genet uh, cinematographer of Very Long Engagement and Amelie. I thought it looked great. Danny Elfman did the score. I thought kind of a demure score, a demure score for Danny Elfman. Okay, before the battery dies, what would you give this film? Um, three out of five. I would give it a three and out of five. It was a fun watch. It, it was fun, and it, I, I thought Amy Adams was uh, good and very frustrating, and uh, besides Mr. Russell and some uh, tricky navigations that the cast has to make it through, uh, like Brian Tyree Henry, I, I think overall, uh, fantastic cast and pretty impressive. I should give a shout out to Isla Fisher. I did her hair once and confused her for Amy Adams, and she was not happy. Are uh, you well? <laughs> you, I, think, I think that's what Tom Ford was playing on when he cast them both in Nocturnal Animals. Oh, sure. Do you have anything else? Uh, no. Okay. Toodaloo.